Hello there and welcome back to A Study in the Study, A Gospel to the Point. I hope, as before, you've got your Bible at the ready, something on which you might take some notes, and of course, a cuppa, all of which are important and necessary when we meet to study God's Word together. Let us begin as we usually do, with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for Mark and for your inspiring him to pen this book. Help us now as we meet Jesus for the first time in his narrative. Bless us in the meeting, we pray, in his name. Amen. Last time we met, we began a new series looking at Mark's Gospel. Of course, you'll know from that that I shouldn't really call this Mark's Gospel, because Gospel means good news, and this isn't Mark's good news, nor is it good news about him. This is the gospel according to Mark, or the good news as told to us by Mark. And who is this good news about? It's about Jesus. Mark looks at our world, sees the darkness, and believes that Jesus is the answer to it all, and that his coming, life, ministry, death, and resurrection are the good news that we all need to hear. Of course, to understand why Mark believes this, we must get to know Jesus. And since the gospel is, according to Mark chapter 1 verse 1, the good news about Jesus, then to know the gospel and to know what Christianity is all about, we have to look to Jesus. In today's reading from the gospel, according to Mark, we are finally introduced to him. I hope you will follow along with me as we read Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. You can do this on your own Bible, or you could follow along on an app or online. If you are watching this online, then the link to the passage is in the description below. You might just need to scroll down a little and look for verse 9, which is where we begin our reading today. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. At once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Amen. You can already get a sense of the pacing of Mark's writing. Phrases like, at that time and at once, move the narrative along at quite a speed. I've mentioned this before, but I'm drawn to the theory that the reason for the pace is that Mark is transcribing the words of the Apostle Peter, who is desperately trying to make sure the good news of Jesus is recorded. That doesn't change the meaning of the gospel, nor does it affect how we can interpret and understand it. It just adds a little bit of flavour and reminds us that this is grounded in real events that were experienced and described by real people. You may remember from last time that both Mark's narrative and John the Baptist were preparing the way for Jesus, getting the reader and the people of the time ready to meet him. Now Jesus appears. Mark's telling of this seems to stick just to the main points. Jesus appeared and was baptised by John. In the other gospel writings, particularly Matthew and Luke, this event is expanded and we have more of a dialogue between Jesus and John, where Jesus explains that his baptism is part of fulfilling the Old Testament predictions about him and therefore must take place. This is in spite of John's protests. Remember in verse 7, he said that he isn't even worthy to untie Jesus' sandals, never mind baptise him. 
one event which is included by all the gospel writers is what happened next. After Jesus' baptism, those present told that they saw a dove descend upon Jesus and a voice declare that Jesus is, My son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. This moment tells us a great deal about who Jesus is. Incidentally, and before we move on, the voice from heaven is considered to be God. And I use passages like this to joke that God must be Scottish, because other than in the Bible, Scotland is the only place I've ever heard someone say that they were well pleased about something. In Christian belief, we describe God as existing as a trinity. That is to say, we believe that there is one God and only one God, but that he exists simultaneously as three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We use the word Trinity to describe this, but you won't find that word anywhere in the Bible. What you will find, however, is evidence which supports this reality, and this is one such passage. The voice from heaven is the Father, the Son is Jesus emerging from his baptism, and the Holy Spirit is the dove descending upon him. We cannot comprehend God's Trinitarian existence. Indeed, I could try and explain it to you using various metaphors, but these metaphors never quite get it right. In some respects, I think we actually do better just to admit we cannot explain or comprehend this, because any attempt to do so reduces our understanding of God in some way. Let us instead be content not to understand and appreciate or enjoy the complexity and the incomprehensible nature of God. There is, however, something important we learn about God by knowing that he exists as Father, Son and Spirit. Although there are three distinct persons, their relationship is so perfect that together they are one God. It is therefore clear that in and of himself, things like relationship and love matter to God, for they are part of his very being. The Father loves the Son, loves the Spirit so perfectly that their relationship is as one. This helps us to appreciate why God created us as relational beings and desires us to know this perfect kind of love because it reflects something of him. This also tells us something important about Jesus' identity. He is God in human form. The second person of the Trinity came down from heaven and lived on earth. Again, this is not something we can comprehend. How can the infinite God become a finite human being? We don't know. What we believe, though, is that Jesus really was fully God, but he also was fully human. He became one of us. As Jesus' story unfolds, we will learn why that is really important. For now, we simply acknowledge that this man, this Jesus, is God in human form, the second person of the Trinity who came down from heaven and lived on earth as one of us. And he did live as one of us. From his baptism, Mark tells us that Jesus went off and was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. The other gospel writers again give more detail. Mark just gives us the bare facts. This was an ordeal for Jesus, partly meant to test his loyalty to the Father's plan of salvation. A test he passes, by the way, because even although he is now living in human form, their relationship is still perfect and partly as a means for Jesus to understand the worst of human experience. In another New Testament book, the book of Hebrews, Jesus is described like this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. That's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. 
Jesus experienced life as one of us. He didn't get any special treatment just because he was God in human form. More than that, he experienced the worst of this life, not so that he could understand us better. He already has perfect knowledge. But for our sake, we now know that when we come to Jesus by faith and in prayer, we can be confident that he understands us because he lived as one of us. I find that comforting. He understands me because he lived like me. And now Jesus begins his ministry and mission. He takes up the mantle of proclaiming the good news. Through him, we are going to find out how God is bringing light into this dark world and why that really is good news. Who is Jesus? He is the second person of the Trinity, the Son, who came down to earth and lived as a human being. Through him, the gospel, the good news of God, was not just proclaimed, it came crashing into our world and things would never be the same again. But more on that next time. We will leave Mark chapter 1 there. Next time we meet, we'll go forward into the beginning of Mark chapter 2. I'd encourage you in the time between now and then to read the rest of Mark 1, just so you can keep up with the unfolding story of Jesus. I hope you will join me for that. For now, may God bless you, and I'll speak to you soon.